Throughout the second half of the 20th century, spectacular technologies revolutionized scientific understanding of the cell, the basic unit of life. During an interview with biochemist Michael Behe, Strobel learned how this new knowledge has shaken the foundations of Darwin's theory. In the 19th century, when Darwin was alive, uh, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. But with the hard work of science in the 20th century, we've seen that the, the cell is far from simple. It's, it's got very complicated molecular machines and things that are very resistant to Darwinian explanation. Michael Behe has devoted his career to the study of the design and operation of the cell. He has also written extensively on the biochemical challenge to evolution. Most people have no idea of how, how small and complex cells are. A typical cell from you or me, called a eukaryotic cell, is probably a tenth of the size of the head of a pin. And yet, in that single cell, there are about three billion units of DNA making out the chromosomes. And those three billion units make the molecular machines of the cell, literally machines that make the cell work. With computer animation, we can enter the cell. Here, the staggering complexity of its molecular machinery is clearly seen. It's like going into a, an automobile factory. The factory has a large number of machines. The parts have to fit together in very specific ways to do their jobs. And if things go wrong, the cell is in big trouble. And just one cell is enormously complex. But humans, you and I, are made from trillions of cells. And those trillions of cells have to fit together in the right way and do their own job. Darwinism was a lot more plausible when we were thinking about globs of protoplasm than it is when we're thinking about molecular machines. Each of these biochemical machines is a masterpiece of engineering and nanotechnology. They are essential to functions as vital and diverse as vision, photosynthesis, and the production of energy in the cell. Michael Behe has studied several of these machines, including the flagellum, a remarkable rotary motor. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts in all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor. And I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Bee's reaction was not surprising, especially when the bacterial flagellar motor is animated and magnified more than 50,000 times to display the details of its construction and operation. And Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. It's got some tail proteins which act as the propeller. When the flagellum rotates, these push against the water and therefore push the bacterium forward. And the motor uses a flow of acid from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell to power the turning. The bacterial flagellum has two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller. It's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. In all, about 40 different protein parts are required to build a flagellar motor. Half of them are constructor proteins, specialized mechanisms that assemble the flagellum's individual components. Since its discovery, Biologists have tried to understand how a machine of such superb design could have arisen gradually, without foresight or plan, through the biological pathway Darwin envisioned. I think what Darwin was trying to show was that things that look designed aren't really designed, but that we can find naturalistic processes to account for the complexity of life. 
Darwin theorized that every part of every living organism evolved through natural selection, a blind process that acts upon random changes in the cell. Darwin believed that given enough time, these random variations would transform the simplest cells into the great diversity of life that inhabits our planet. In his study of evolution and molecular machines, Michael Behe has raised a significant challenge to the creative power of Darwin's mechanism of natural selection. It is called irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. Irreducible complexity can be illustrated by a familiar non-biological machine, a mouse trap. The trap is composed of five basic pieces, a catch to hold the bait, a strong spring, a thin bent rod called the hammer, a holding bar to secure the hammer in place, and a platform upon which the entire system is mounted. If any one of these parts is missing or defective, the mechanism will not work. All components of this irreducibly complex system must be present simultaneously for the machine to perform its function. Catching mice. The concept of irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellum. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. You can't put something like that together gradually because they need a large number of parts interacting with each other at the same time before they work at all. Without the tools to observe the machinery of the cell, and long before the idea of irreducible complexity, Charles Darwin offered a way to test his own theory. In Origin of Species, he wrote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Darwin acknowledged that if someone identified a biological system that could not have been constructed in incremental steps over long periods of time, then his theory would be invalid. And what Michael Behe and others have discovered is the existence of biological machinery that cannot be explained away by Darwinian processes. Darwin's failed predictions have in fact falsified his own theory. The existence of complex biological machines raises an obvious question. If natural selection wasn't the agent of their construction, then what was? The centerpiece of my investigation was an interview with philosopher of science, Dr. Stephen Meyer. Meyer, who holds a PhD from Cambridge University, brought me face to face with the most efficient information processing system in the universe the DNA molecule and its language of life. The discovery of the information-bearing properties of DNA and RNA is a fundamental challenge to all materialistic theories of the origin of life. Neo-Darwinism and its associated theories of chemical evolution and the like will not be able to survive the biology of the information age, the biology of the 21st century. Meyer's conclusions are based upon his understanding of the DNA molecule and the genetic instructions that are locked within the nucleus of living cells. In 1953, when Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of the DNA molecule, they discovered that DNA was a carrier of genetic information in the form of a four-character digital code. 
That is to say that DNA functions like a software program, only more complex than any anyone has ever created or devised. For a biological system to run and operate, it needs genetic information to build the proteins and protein machines that cause the cells to maintain their function. This information is stored in a precise arrangement of four chemicals that scientists represent with the letters A, C, T, and G. Sequences of these chemicals provide the instructions necessary to assemble complex protein molecules that in turn help form structures as diverse as eyes, legs, wings, and hearts. This code has been called the language of life and it is the most densely packed and elaborately detailed assembly of information in the known universe. Geneticist Michael Denton has estimated that the amount of biological information necessary to build all of the proteins in all of the species of organisms that have ever existed on planet Earth could be held in a single teaspoon. And we'd still have room left over for all of the information contained in every book ever written. The more I learned about DNA, the more I understood the significance of what Stephen Meyer called the most fundamental question facing biology today. Where did the information in DNA come from? How did it arise in the first place? Well, lots of people have wanted to explain the origin of information by reference to the laws of physics and chemistry or by reference to the chemical properties of the constituent parts of the DNA. But that would be like saying that you could explain the information in this morning's uh, New York Times headline by reference to the physics and chemistry of ink bonding to paper. There is a chemical explanation as to why the ink sticks to the paper, but that does not explain the way the ink got arranged to convey a message that could be understood by speakers of the English language. Information requires a material medium, but it transcends the material medium. An explanation for the origin of the genetic instructions needed to build the first life is the holy grail of 21st century biology. Theories proposing that this information arose through natural selection acting upon non-living molecules or the self-organizing power of chemicals in a primordial soup have repeatedly failed. Even time and blind chance, the oft-invoked saviors of implausible biological scenarios, have fallen far short as accounts for the source of the instructions in DNA. Mathematicians, for example, have calculated that a universe filled with monkeys, typing relentlessly throughout the oldest estimated age of the cosmos, would have no realistic chance of producing Shakespeare's play Hamlet let alone a transcript of the genetic information required to build even the simplest living cell. Based on our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past, there is only one known cause for the origin of information, and that cause is intelligence. Whether we're looking at a hieroglyphic inscription, a section of text in a book, or a computer software, if you have information and you trace it back to its source, invariably you come to an intelligence. Therefore, when you find information inscribed along the backbone of the DNA molecule in the cell, the most rational inference based on our repeated experience is that an intelligence of some kind played a role in the origin of that information. The implications of the scientific evidence, coupled with Meyer's logic, are profound. If we are finding information inside every cell and every living creature, could that not be, in a sense, the signature of a creator? Thirty centuries before science unlocked the mysteries of genetic information, or a telescope probed billions of light years into space. The Hebrew shepherd and poet David wrote eloquently of a creator who revealed his existence and power through all that he had made. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they proclaim knowledge. Their voice goes out into all the earth, 
their words to the end of the world. God himself is invisible. He is a spirit. And yet, one of the purposes he has for us is to find him so we can know him. And he's left behind a series of clues. And sometimes we just have to kind of take our blinders off and get beyond our presuppositions and say, wait a minute, I am going to pursue the evidence of science wherever it points. And if it takes me to a very uncomfortable conclusion that there is a creator, then if the evidence points in that direction, that's the way I'm going to go. According to a lot of the mainstream media, the theory of intelligent design is a faith-based idea. And in saying that, they want to dismiss it as something that has no basis in science. But the media has confused a fundamental issue. They're confusing the evidence for the theory with the implications of the theory. The theory of intelligent design may well have implications that are supportive of theistic belief, but the theory is not based on theistic belief. It's based on the discovery of digital code in cells, miniature machines in cells, the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and chemistry, and standard ways of scientific reasoning about the remote past in the history of life. Forty years ago, a lecture in a high school biology class convinced an inquisitive 14-year-old freshman that there was no God. Ironically, years later, it was an open-minded investigation of scientific evidence that led Lee Strobel to belief in a creator. One of the most interesting things I've learned as I've gone on this journey of scientific discovery has been that you don't have to commit intellectual suicide to come to the conclusion that there is an intelligent designer. Because today, science is pointing more directly and more powerfully toward a creator than any other time in the history of the world. I was trained in journalism and law to respond to truth. I had to take a step of faith in the same direction that that evidence is flowing which is logical and rational. We do that every day of our life. We make steps of faith based on the evidence that we perceive. And so it was the most logical and rational step I've ever taken to put my faith in the creator that science tells me exists.